Thanks for tuning in to our series on the book of Zechariah. We have now come to the six most exciting chapters. I believe we can say with certainty that once the prophecies regarding the city of Damascus are fulfilled, the rest of the prophecies will fall like dominoes uh, regarding the end of the age and the return of the Lord. Let's listen to David Barron. The overthrow of world power and the establishment of Messiah's kingdom may be given as the epitome of the last chapters of Zechariah. The two oracles which make up the second half of the book, chapters 9 through 11 and then chapters 12 through 14. Both sections treat of war between the heathen world and Israel, though in different ways. Today we will discuss Zechariah 9. Stay tuned. Welcome to Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. The world has entered into a time of paradigm shift when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Signs and wonders, miracles and healings attest to this truth. It is the time of the coming of the Lord. Join Teresa as we discuss how to prepare our hearts and loved ones in understanding the end of the age. I'm Teresa Garcia. Today we begin chapter 9 in our study of Zechariah, the end time prophet. The final six chapters of Zechariah are really two separate oracles or prophecies. So what's the difference? Let's let Mike Bickle explain. The two prophetic oracles. Both prophecies begin with burden, which is translated oracle. Both oracles speak of war between the Gentile world powers and Israel, but in different ways. The first oracle, Zechariah 9 through 11, the Messiah will deliver, empower, and regather Israel and overthrow her enemies. The Messiah will save, refine, and transform Israel in the context of a global war. Then in the second oracle, 12 through 14, this gives us more details about the global war that is introduced in the first oracle. Jesus will use the weak military power of Israel as a weapon in his hands against the nations. Heavenly Father, as we see these things coming, which were prophesied so long ago. We daily pray for the peace of Jerusalem and we believe that our prayers ascend before your throne and are saved uh, in vials so that at the time when the Jews need the prayer, you will send the answers during the tribulation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9. The burden of the word of the Lord against the land of Hadrach and Damascus its resting place. For the eyes of men and all the tribes of Israel are on the Lord. And I believe the eyes of Israel might be on the Lord because they were the ones that destroyed Damascus. That is a possible scenario. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute. But let's go to another place where we learn of the future of Damascus, Isaiah 17, verse 1. The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Now we have to remember that Damascus is the oldest city in the world that has been continually inhabited. It was already present in Genesis 14, and it has never been destroyed. It is a jewel in the crown of Islam, and when it is destroyed, this will be extremely traumatic throughout the whole world. And so it's also told in Amos 1 that it will be destroyed. We're not going to go there in the interest of time. But let me say this, that I believe the destruction of Damascus precedes the Ezekiel War because the destruction of Damascus is in Isaiah 17, 1, and the last four chapters in Isaiah 17 are the Ezekiel War. 
So now let's get more information about the destruction of Damascus by going to Jeremiah chapter 29. I explain it in the book from the hidden. A careful reading of Jeremiah 49 prophesies a naval attack. In other words, coming up the Mediterranean Sea uh, leading to a fire in Damascus. We're going to be putting verses 23 through 27 on the screen. 25, I believe, is parenthetical. It is God himself speaking and saying this. Why is the city of praise not deserted? The city of my joy. Obviously, Jerusalem. What is he saying? I believe this is what happens. The Syrians are attacking Israel. They must either destroy Damascus or evacuate Jerusalem. They choose, therefore, to destroy Damascus. Let's listen to Jeremiah. Against Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are shamed, for they have heard bad news. They are faint-hearted. There is trouble. Where? On the sea. It cannot be quiet. Damascus has grown feeble. She turns to flee, and fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her, like a woman in labor. Now God speaking. Why is the city of praise not deserted, the city of my joy? Therefore Syria's young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord of hosts. I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it shall consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad, or we would say today, it will consume the palaces of Bashar Assad. Now I'm going to give you an, uh, an outline of the way I think the end time events will play out up to the tribulation. Again, I'm not sure about Syria attacking Israel. I don't see that in the word. Let's take a look. Possible progression of end time events. Syria will attack Israel. Israel will counterattack by sea to save Jerusalem, firing against Damascus. Indignation at the destruction of Damascus will cause Russia and the Muslim community to fight the Ezekiel War, but God will defeat the Russian and Muslim invaders on the mountains of Israel, and then a Syrian diplomat will come to Jerusalem to broker a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. This diplomat is the Antichrist. Now, before we return to Zechariah 9, I want to do a quick side trip to Ezekiel chapter 38. And we know that before the Ezekiel War begins, Ezekiel, uh, Israel will be at peace with her neighbors. Let's listen to that. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Now, why are they safe? This is my opinion, that when all the other Arabs see Israel bomb Damascus, they'll say, hey, if they could do it to them, they can do it to us, and they will all make peace treaties with uh, Israel. Just as, for example, in 2003, when President Bush marched into Iraq, Muammar Gaddafi of Libya said, hey, I'm giving up my nukes. If they can topple Hussein, they can topple me. I want no part of it. And so I believe the Arabs will make peace with Israel before the Ezekiel War. Remember, there aren't any Arabs in the Ezekiel War. Many Muslims, yes, but none of them Arabs. Now let's return to Zechariah chapter 9 as we see judgment coming. Also against Hamath, which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise, for Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust, and gold like the mire of the streets, 
Behold, the Lord will cast her out. He will destroy her power in the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Now, this had a fulfillment in the time of Alexander the Great. So verses 1 through 7 have an intermediate fulfillment and then an end time from fulfillment. Let's find out what happened to the city of Tyre during the days of Alexander. We'll put a drawing on the screen. Tyre and Sidon were major cities of Phoenicia. Tyre built a fortress on an island about one half mile from the mainland. Tyre mocked Alexander as she foolishly trusted in this fortified city. Alexander built a causeway from the mainland to the island city and quickly destroyed it. And so even though there were intermediate fulfillments in those days, everything was not fulfilled, specifically not verse 7. Let's listen now to verses 6 and 7. A mixed race shall settle in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. But he who remains, even he, shall be for our God, and shall be like a leader in Judah, and Ekron like a Jebusite. And so a partial fulfillment in Alexander's time but this part was never fulfilled. But he who remains, even he, will be for our God. That was never fulfilled. Let's listen to uh, David Barron on that. Here we are reminded once again that though the more immediate reference of the prophecy in this chapter was to Alexander's march and conquests, it looked on and merges into a more distant future. Kohler rightly points out that this seventh verse was not fulfilled by the deeds of Alexander, since neither the remnant of the Phoenicians nor the other heathen dwelling in the midst of Israel were converted to Jehovah through the calamities connected with his expedition. Kiel observed... We must go a step further and say that the fulfillment has not yet reached its end and will not until the kingdom of Christ shall attain that complete victory over the heathen world. Now, before we go back to future events, I want to talk about one more event in Alexander's time. That is when he marched on the city of Jerusalem. He had just destroyed Gaza, and the high priest had refused to pay, uh, pay Alexander tribute. So when he found out that Alexander was headed for Jerusalem, he sought God with supplication and sacrifice. God told him, one, take courage, two, adorn the city, three, open the gates, four, have all the people dress in white, and you put on your full high priestly regalia. Let's find out from Josephus in his Antiquities what happened. And when the Phoenicians and the Chaldeans that followed Alexander thought they should have the liberty to plunder the city of Jerusalem and torment the high priest to death, the very reverse of it happened. For Alexander, when he saw the multitude at a distance in white garments, while the priest stood clothed in fine linen and the high priest in purple and scarlet clothing with his mitre on his head, he approached by himself and adored that name and first saluted the high priest. Whereupon the kings of Syria and the rest were surprised at what Alexander had done and supposed him disordered in his mind and asked him how it came to pass that when all others adored him, he should adore the high priest of the Jews, to whom Alexander replied, I did not adore him, but that God who hath honored him with his high priesthood. For I saw this very person in a dream in this very habit, exhorting me to make no delay, but boldly to pass over the sea, 
for that he would conduct my army and would give me dominion over the Persians. Continuing now in Zechariah, the word house is talking about the tribulation temple. I will camp around my house because of the army of the Antichrist, because of him who passes by and him who returns. No more shall an oppressor pass through them, for now I have seen with my eyes. Next, we have two verses that are separated by 2,000 years. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And of course, we call that Palm Sunday. Now his glorious return. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now the rest of today's chapter is about about the Armageddon campaign. Let's get a definition from Mike Bickle. People talk a lot about the battle of Armageddon. That is not technically a biblical concept. Armageddon is a a three-and-a-half-year campaign. Armageddon is an area in the north of Israel. It is the military staging area for many battles. The main battle, which people call the battle of Armageddon, is really the battle for Jerusalem. Continuing now, let's pick it up in verse 11. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, meaning the crucifixion of Jesus, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. Mike Bickle says this is Jesus setting free Jews who are in concentration camps during the tribulation. Now, uh, the next verse is very powerful. For I have bent Judah, the two southern tribes, my bow, and fitted the bow with Ephraim, the ten northern tribes, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. Now, that had an intermediate fulfillment when Judas the Maccabean destroyed uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. That was in the year 164 B.C. But we need further understanding on that verse. Let's listen to David Barron. The prophecy cannot be altogether restricted to the Maccabean struggle with the Syrian Greeks. No. Zion and Greece are in this prophecy of Zechariah opposed to one another as the city of God and the city of the world. And the defeat of Antiochus Epiphanes and his successors at the hands of a comparative handful of despised Jews to which this passage may primarily refer, foreshadows the final conflict with world power and the judgments to be inflicted on the confederated armies who shall be gathered against Jerusalem, not only directed by the hand of God, but also by who? The hand of Israel, who shall then be made strong in Jehovah. Now, in the next verse, we learn that Jesus goes to the south first before he comes up to Jerusalem. Let's listen. Then the Lord will be seen over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. The Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. So first he goes to Petra to release uh, those who have been hiding for three and a half years. And then uh, releasing prisoners as he goes, he marches up to Jerusalem. And this will be discussed further when we read chapter 14. Now we have an extremely interesting verse. Pay special attention to the words sling stones. The Lord of hosts will defend them. 
They shall devour and subdue with sling stones. They shall drink and roar as if with wine. They shall be filled with blood like basins, like the corners of the altar. The word sling stones in there is put there on purpose to remind us that David killing Goliath is a type of Jesus destroying the Antichrist. Let's uh, listen now in 1 Samuel 18. So David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistines and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw it, that their champion was dead, they fled. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. So why did G David take Goliath's head to Jerusalem? For two reasons. And it was very heavy, by the way, and he had to walk 10 miles, so he had to have a good reason. First of all, uh, is Jerusalem was still in the hands of the Jebusites, and he was making the point the Israeli army is a force to be reckoned with. Secondly, it is prophesying toward or foretelling the fact that the Antichrist will die in Jerusalem. Let's look at the demise of the Antichrist. The Apostle Paul tells us, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Isaiah 14, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass, as I have purposed, so it shall stand, that I will break the Assyrian. Where? In my land, and on my mountains, tread him underfoot. Again, Isaiah 30. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod. For Tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king Antichrist it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. By the way, Tophet is where they sacrificed babies to Moloch in ancient times. Listen to Dake. Tophet is ordained for the king, the Assyrian of verse 31. It no doubt pictures the exact spot where the Antichrist will be destroyed. And then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So Zechariah chapter 9 uh, is a prototype of what God, Jesus is going to do to the ungodly nations. He reveals his nature. He humbles the proud, cleanses sin, and then in some cases offers salvation. Let's listen to the end of our chapter. The Lord their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people, and they shall be like the jewels of a crown lifted like a banner over his land. For how, how great is his goodness and how great his beauty. Grain shall make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. So we end on a happy note. Remember that at the end of the tribulation, all Israel will be saved. We will be right back. Teresa's 10-part DVD series, The Man of Sin, is now available for only $27. This includes shipping and handling. Using both the Old and New Testaments, Teresa explains the geographic area from which the Antichrist will come, who he will attack militarily, and how he will deceive the world. Will he come back from the dead? What is the abomination of desolation? Which nations produce the Ten Kings? Who destroys Rome mid-tribulation? 
and why? The answers are in Teresa's 10-part DVD series, The Man of Sin. This series includes the 10-part DVD series, The Man of Sin, hard copies of charts, quotes, and prophecies used on the screen, the pamphlet Honor the Blood, and Teresa's essays, Inevitability of the Third Temple, and Israel's Covenant with Death and Hell. Send $27 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291. We take Visa and MasterCard, or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. If you would also like a copy of Teresa's book, From the Hidden, you will understand it perfectly. For only $10, $4 off the regular price, send $37 to Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291 or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. And thank you for including your tax-deductible donation when you order. Attention students of End Time Prophecy. If you would like to understand the book of Zechariah, you may order Teresa's 10-part DVD series, Zechariah, End Time Prophet. This includes an in-depth discussion of the eight visions Zechariah had in one night, detailing the future of the Jewish people from 519 B.C. to the coming of Messiah. Teresa also compares the four chariots of Zechariah 6 with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Zechariah gives their identity and what direction they go. Revelation tells us why. Then Zechariah chapters 9 through 14 give the most comprehensive description of the Armageddon campaign in the Bible. Included is a notebook with copies of the charts used on the screen. Send $33 to Teresa Garcia, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291. We take Visa and MasterCard at 618-281-3291, or you may order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. You may also add Teresa's updated expanded book on the end times from the hidden final edition for $12, $4 off the regular price. It contains 210 pages of information on the European Union, Middle East, and the end of the age. For the series Zechariah, End Time Prophet, and From the Hidden, final edition, send $45 to Teresa Garcia, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291, or order online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. Next week, we will conclude the first oracle as we look at Zechariah chapters 10 and 11. In Zechariah chapter 10, we will see the Lord blessing Israel and regathering them. Then in chapter 11, a sad chapter where we see the Jews reject the good shepherd, later embrace the evil shepherd. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we will see you again next week. Thank you for watching Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia. You may contact us at Teresa Garcia Ministry, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236, or call 618-281-3291, or visit us online at TeresaGarciaMinistry.com. You may also find us on Facebook at Teresa Garcia Ministry. For prayer requests, call 618-281-3291 or mail them to Teresa Garcia, P.O. Box 494, Columbia, Illinois, 62236. Be sure to join us again next week for another edition of Understanding the End of the Age with Teresa Garcia.